tua uh, just from from what we've said so far some of the keys that you're going to need which we talked about this morning first of all diversification you have to be able to know how to do more than one thing so you've got to start with yourself and think about all the range and there's a little exercise uh, that that you were handed uh, the range of your experience uh, last night I, I had the opportunity to have uh, dinner with, with an IEEE member from this area who teaches at Embry-Riddle University and uh, she has an undergraduate degree in English and a master's degree in engineering and what she does for a living is she writes she writes grants for the university uh, I don't know how many of you uh, would think about uh, taking those technical skills uh, and, for example, making a, making a transition to technical writing. Uh, if you're a good writer, uh, you, you, you are rare, and uh, if you have the technical expertise to, to be able to write well about, about technical subjects, uh, you have an opportunity. That's just one example of, of taking what you already have and recasting it in such a way uh, that you become uh, more employable and that you think of more things, more areas that you might want to go into. And Tarek this afternoon in his resume section uh, is going to uh, is going to have some great things about about how you think about these things uh, to create a create a uh, good resume. Value added. What value do you add? Uh, an employer, a potential employer, doesn't care if you can talk like Dilbert. Uh, what is it that you actually can bring to the table when you when you interview or when you search when you search for a job? Uh, is there something uh, concrete there? Think about that. What value do you what value do you add? Uh, whether you're currently employed or whether you're looking for a job, you have to know this. You know there are some jobs that are disappearing. And uh, as you look around, as you strategize, what kinds of jobs are most likely to be outsourced in your own, in your own organization? And if you see in future that you're not going to be adding much value, then you need to, you need to start thinking about transition. Uh, here's a value proposition from a resume. Uh, director of business development, 15 years experience with a record of success in delivering profit-driven technology solutions committed to increasing revenues, making sales, identifying new business opportunities, developing strategic partnerships, and so on. Uh, this is from a resume. Uh, Tarek is going to improve on that. Uh, you need to do a gap analysis. That's it. I like this symbol of gap. Uh, where are you and what are the requirements of the, of the jobs that you want? What, what, what's the difference? Make a list of the requirements of the job, the life you want, and where you are, where you are right now, and do an analysis and see what is needed to make that transition, uh, to, to bridge that gap. Uh, there is an opportunity in consulting. I especially like this slide. I think uh, I'm proud of myself for, for including it. Uh, the mouse uh, consulting with, uh, with the cat. Uh, I've been a consultant for a long time, and uh, it is not an easy road. And uh, we're going to hear about entrepreneurship uh, this afternoon in a much more, much more detailed kind of, uh, kind of fashion. It really does demand that, that uh, you take Ed's advice this morning and think of yourself as a business, and there are, there are a whole lot of things involved in that. Now, what about IEEE members? Uh, we asked about, not about would you like to leave your current job for this. Uh, we didn't ask, uh, do you expect to be, to be uh, unemployed? We asked, uh, what are your, your work plans for your retirement? And we asked folks to check all of them that, that applied. And uh, almost 35% of the respondents uh, suggested uh, that, they, that they would like to work as a work as a consultant. So the session this afternoon should be especially valuable to those of you who are who are thinking entrepreneurially uh, and may have that may have that ambition. It's a it's a uh, that requires some very real business business planning. 
Uh, any, any questions so far? Did we get any questions from anybody outside? I noticed a couple of flashing. Okay, I noticed a couple flashing by me. Education options. Uh, how many of you are pursuing uh, degrees right now? About a third. Uh, how many of those are graduate degrees in, in, biz in business? Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the education landscape uh, has changed remarkably over the last, the last five years, the last ten years. Part of my work is with, is with uh, accreditation in higher education. And uh, we have a, if all you need to do is watch television or turn on your computer, uh, to see the reach of the University of Phoenix, for example, uh, along with a whole lot of other uh, for-profit uh, organizations, some of which are awful, uh, some of which are extraordinarily good. So, if you're thinking about if you're thinking about getting that sort of a degree, shop around a little bit. Uh, but but it is possible now to to take a degree. Uh, without ever setting foot on campus, and that for people in transition is extraordinarily important, so you need to think about that. On the other hand, if you have an advanced degree and you want to teach, the, the opportunities are enormous. How many of you work as, work as adjunct professors someplace? One. one. Uh, we're, we're continually looking for people to teach. And if you are, if you if you have a specialty, uh, and don't just think it's it has to be engineering, because uh, if you if you relate well, especially to adult students, and you and you uh, can teach mathematics, for example, uh, you would be very much very much in demand. One of the things that that I've observed about higher education is that it it has been outsourced. Lou Dobbs never got around to this. Lou Dobbs never got around to higher education. But it has basically been outsourced. What do I mean by that? Uh, fewer, and I talked about the, the tenure system, where you could have a job, a job for life. Fewer and fewer people in higher education, even if they're being hired full time, are being hired on, on tenure tracks, which means that they would, if they, if they work out well for the, for the institution, that they would be given tenure. Uh, those jobs are shrinking. Increasingly, uh, part-time faculty positions, including uh, one course at a time, are, are to be found. The University of Phoenix has no such thing as tenure, and the longest contract it, it extends is one year. So uh, that may not be so relevant if you are if you're looking for work that will do two things for you, three things. One, uh, it will it will uh, enhance your life because teaching can be extraordinarily rewarding. Uh, you'll meet a lot of people. You'll make a lot of contacts. Two, uh, it is it is a great uh, item on a resume. Uh, people people like to see that. They they are uh, sometimes impressed by it. Uh, but they they know that you've developed some expertise and you're able to able to communicate it. And third, uh, it will put you in touch with the university community in which there is probably a fairly large network. Uh, and that's true even in small organizations. And if you take that opportunity and, and really uh, network with people, really really take it seriously and, and uh, become a part of the community, it can be an enormous uh, opportunity. Why do I take time with that? Because I think that it is, uh, it is a very real opportunity. We, one of the things that I, I do is, is surveys with, with uh, higher education. And uh, last survey we did, uh, they allowed their part-time people to, to respond. There were more part-time people responding, more part-time people responding, many of them part-time faculty, than both full-time faculty and staff. So 
It's bad for some folks, maybe bad for the students, but, but uh, good for us if we're looking for an opportunity. Uh, recasting accomplishments. The idea that you have that you have managed projects, for example, uh, you can bring to the fore. You can make that you can make that uh, something special in the way in the way you 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 present yourself. Uh, you need to think about uh, how what you've already done may be may be applied in a new in a new context. You have to have willingness. To risk. I'll give you a second to read the caption there. I don't know why I think this is funny, uh, but I do. And I, I, I was looking for a, for a, uh, a cartoon to symbolize risk, and this is, this is it. Uh, when you're under great stress and you're looking for work or you're afflicted by one of those four areas, uncertainty, a couple of them may be ambiguity, you don't know what direction things are going in. It is hard to think of yourself uh, taking a risk, but risk uh, appropriately managed uh, is, is a, really a pathway to, to important change. And since the word risk is up here, uh, risk is increasingly uh, an area in which you can apply your skills. How many of you have have uh, gotten into any area of risk management. What what are they? Just program risks. Okay, good. What are some what are some areas of risk that that have emerged recently? Schedule risk. Cost risk, all the thing, all the things that come into play in terms of both of management and specifically project management, where you might have skills that would be, you know, extraordinarily important in a management or project management area. Any others? How about cybersecurity? We have, you know, we have the fear that people are peeking back at us when we look when we look at our computer. We have had invasions of, of uh, power sources. Right? We have had uh, some very serious breaches. It was a great 60 minutes uh, program on the risks we face in, in, the, in, in cyber, cyber security. That's just one area. Power is just one area. Uh, the guy in the room who has the greatest expertise in this area is Ed Perkins. So if you want to if you want to talk with him about uh, about the the opportunities in this in this area, and we have another uh, another CWPC member who is who is developing some uh, certifications in in risk that will assist people in in developing their careers in this area. I'm not selling those. I'm simply I'm simply indicating this as a as a trend that you might think of. So if you're going to be creative. Look at the areas not only where people see positive opportunity, but where, where you might find uh, areas of fear or necessity or where the money is going, like Homeland Security. And I think as soon as I say that, I think again of being scanned. Uh, they, 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 they didn't strip search or beat me. They just, they just scanned. I, I was afraid, you know, if I didn't turn out quite right, I'd be, I'd be taken away. But, but uh, all of these areas uh, have a lot of money and a lot of promise for for new create new careers. Location. Uh, you shouldn't put this on a resume, I don't think, but many people do. They say they're willing to relocate. How many of you would be willing to relocate for, for a job right now? How many of you would not? And I, that would depend on, well, that would depend on, <laughs> you don't want to leave this beautiful area. But that's, that comes into, into uh, being creative about, about uh, work planning. Uh, Ed said this morning, think of yourself as a business. Uh, where are you going to be? Uh, your location, if you were to strategically design a business, 
do a business plan, you'd have to think about where you'd, where you'd like to be. We heard again this morning that this is a great area that, and there are opportunities to relocate here. But think about this. Uh, I, and this is, this is really, not, really not very readable. Uh, it is from an Atlantic article uh, by Richard Florida. And uh, Tom Friedman, for a while, was convincing us that the world is flat. Uh, the world is not flat. The world is spiky. And uh, this is an illustration of that. And there are several different things that, you are, that are illustrated there. But you can think about, uh, for example, indices of, of creativity, uh, of publications, of, of patents, those kinds of things. Well, those, there are centers in the world which, which are very spiky in those, spiky in technology. Uh, part of this has to do with light, uh, how much light is emitted from different parts of the world. And when you see that, uh, what you find is, of course, that North Korea is about the only place in the world that is completely dark. But the, but the rest of the world, we have these spikes, and they are, in fact, spikes of... Uh, of uh, technology, there are spikes of opportunity, and uh, let me give you one example. Uh, I had a team of students working with, with uh, uh, Oshkosh Bagash, you know that, you know that company? Oshkosh Bagash. Uh, it was formerly located in Oshkosh, which is about 10 miles from, from where I live. And uh, where is it now? in a lot of different places. It's no longer, no longer in Oshkosh. When, I, when we were working with them, all of the manufacturing had gone to other places in the world. But what they told me when I was, when I was there, one of the people who was, who was the executive in charge of, the, of that place, said, uh, we, have, we have an enormously creative staff here. And they did. And you'd visit and you'd see these little kids coming in to, to model clothing and they would, and they would uh, do focus groups and they would design kids' clothing, which was very stylish. And, and, uh, so we said, well, you see, we've outsourced the manufacturing, but the intellectual property is going to stay here. Well, where, did, where is that, where is that uh, design center now, do you think? Take a guess. No, not China. It would be little Chinese kids coming in, but that's... No, New York. Because New York is the center of, of fashion design, one of the centers in the world. So if, a, if you did that, if you did how the world is spiky in terms of fashion design, New York would have an enormous, enormous spike. Well, the, the designers wanted to go there. Uh, I like Oshkosh. It's a nice little town. But if I saw myself as a designer, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily be there. We have, and I'm just giving you local examples, not, not from engineering, but just from this, this uh, inclination to go where, where there is a center, where there are other people doing the kind of work you like to do. And for example, a person I knew who had an des interior design company and has designed all of the interiors for McDonald's around the country, extraordinarily successful, uh, worked in our little town for many years, gone somewhere where the, where the not, not, not because of labor costs, but because of creativity. So translate that into, into your own situation and think about where, where you might not only be willing to go, but where you might have to go as, as we have the complex uh, transition of, of organizations that are either being outsourced uh, or, or maybe moving because they find uh, a uh, what they see as a better place. You have to have a success mindset. If you go into an interview or you write a letter or you, or you put, post something on LinkedIn or Twitter and you say, or Facebook, and you indicate in any way that you are discouraged or that you are negative, or that you are in need, uh, you will begin to exclude yourself.
from, from consideration. Uh, this success mindset, I mean, we read a whole lot about that. I mentioned learned optimism to you. Uh, but it actually happens to be true. Think about the people you want to be around. Think about the people who, to whom you respond, the people you would like to hire. And uh, they have energy, they have life, they have interests, they, have, they, they look towards success. And their failures are interpreted differently. They're, they're interpreted as opportunities for growth or change. They're not seen as failure. So, uh, you need to be positive, you need to be clear, you know why you're contacting people, for example, in your job search. Don't be needy, be respectful, be prepared for and know how to handle rejection. Uh, we've all experienced rejection. One of the things that, that we need to remember is that rejection for a job should not constitute isolation. And one of the worst things you can do uh, in, in a circumstance where you're, where you're uncertain about your job or you're looking for a new one uh, is, is to isolate yourself or feel like you have been isolated. Uh, there have been some studies uh, of people's brains uh, in experiments around isolation. And if you feel like you have been rejected by a group or that you have been set aside or you feel isolated, your brain responds in the same way as it does to physical pain. So exclusion is as serious as physical pain. So you want to avoid that. You want, you want to, to, to have a supportive community. What do people need to succeed? They need to have, uh, first of all, the opportunity to develop their skills, which you have. They need the opportunity to, in this case, as we're looking at it, uh, the opportunity to reflect on those skills and on your values and on what you want. And third, you need a supportive community. People in life who will tell you, and I've known some of these folks in graduate programs, will t who will tell you that they have succeeded against the odds. If they tell you your li their life story and you would never have expected them to, to, have, to have succeeded in any way in life, they will tell you that at least one person, at least one person in their lives, uh, was extraordinarily important in, in supporting them. So you need the values, you need the skills, you also need the, the, support, of, the support of community to maintain this. Uh, there are some resources here. Uh, there are a lot of re resources. I mentioned uh, the one on, on the, authentic happiness. Uh, quintessential careers. Uh, it's a little website, it's useful. It's got a test of career marketability for job seekers. It's a job quiz. It's kind of good. You can, you can fill this out and get your results. And uh, there are a number of sites like this. This is a pattern of reflection. Another part of your pattern of reflection, and we have a diverse group here this morning from a lot of different, uh, different areas, uh, is to be able to target companies. Uh, based on your skills and a good and what you know is a good fit and to be able, as Ed indicated this morning, maybe to do some interviewing of people who are part of those companies. Informational interviewing, informal interviewing. You know, we, we know that companies work on their corporate image and corporate brand and there are systems for valuing corporate brands and so they're very protective of brand and a whole lot around, around risk. In the, in the corporate world is built around, and social responsibility is really built around, around not damaging, damaging their brand. So they work very hard to look good. Uh, you, should, you should talk to people in any organization that you are, you are contemplating, uh, applying for a job for, to, to find out uh, what else might, might exist. Uh, you shouldn't be afraid to use, uh, to use technology. Uh, I like this slide too. I tell you that I'm proud of myself for a few things, and one of which is this slide with the peeps. Uh, and one peep is a little bit different here. Uh, all tweets are not are not equal. Uh, 
I myself personally am not a great, a great fan of Twitter. Uh, I have people who say they follow me, but, but for the most part I stand still, so if they're following me, I, 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 don't, know, I don't know what they're doing. Uh, but it is another avenue. And uh, it may, you know, you, usually we're used to, how many of you tweet? We're used to, we're used to Paris Hilton. Uh, I know people who work for, for different kinds of not-for-profits, uh, including some very big hospital systems whose job it is to, to monitor the tweets and to monitor the Facebook and to deal with, uh, deal with this electronic world so that they are able to track trends and in fact in some cases uh, find employees through, through areas like LinkedIn. But the, but the main point is not to be afraid of this. Uh, to, to do a little bit of research, to try it out, to protect your privacy certainly as you do it. Uh, I think there's some good points here. To use Twitter to expand and reinforce your online brand. Uh, to profile and tweet, the profile and tweets can improve search engine results. Uh, you can find real-time job postings there. There are, there are some. Uh, you can find and follow recruiters. You can find your targets and so on. So uh, this is not to be neglected. Not to be neglected too, in addition to your network and the technology, uh, is the possibility of using a headhunter. Now we don't have time to go through a lot of a lot of this, but you know headhunters uh, work for the company that's doing the doing the hiring. They don't work for you, and uh, you can find a whole lot of them online. They range from, and you can find some locally. We have found in doing these presentations around the country that there are some, and we've had some folks speak, uh, headhunters who are very very adept at, at dealing with with uh, folks in technology fields. And uh, you might find someone locally who, who is doing placement and can advise you not just on what jobs are available, but what jobs are likely to be available. These headhunters uh, range from the very high level of like Park Avenue headhunters like Hydric and Struggles who you'd go to if you wanted to find a CEO for Apple. Uh, as I said, down to, down to folks who work, work locally and you need to work with these people uh, carefully because if they like you, they may, they may assist you, they would provide you with some opportunities, uh, but they don't work for you, they work for the, for the uh, client company. Uh, this is from a 2008 IEEE employment survey. Respondents reported they found networking and internet job sites effective, whereas job fairs, headhunters, outplacement service, and classified ads were not of much help. Networks are extraordinarily important. Did I skip something here? I believe there was a slide that indicated how most people found jobs. And you know how most people found it, find jobs? Take a guess. Hmm? People you know, absolutely, word of mouth. Uh, some, jobs, some jobs are not even advertised, right? And so you have to, one of the things, you know, I mentioned the spirituality stuff at the beginning. One of the folks, my friends in the, I'm a little bit, you know, a little bit squeamish about too much of that. But one of the things that they, that, that they say is that you have to hold an intention for things to happen. Well, I have discovered that actually they're right. If you, if you have something in mind that you want, if you, if you, if you uh, know what you're looking for, you are more likely to notice when someone brings something up in conversation. You are more likely to notice hiring. You are more likely to notice uh, trends than you, otherwise, than you otherwise might be. So that, that idea of holding an intention really is quite important. And it's especially important in in uh, networking. Yes, I'm sorry. We have some tips on the internet job site. The problem on the internet job site is one, uh, some posting jobs, some are reposting multiple times, secondly, some are reposted by other recruiters 
who are not actually constructed in the school year, so trying to get out So it's really hard to, or, to, to tell on the internet job site that it's either a real job company, or some recruiters simply try to pass in the risk. Yes. That's, you, you just pointed out a, a risk, and uh, we will talk more about that later. Tarek has an observation. Just a comment here. That group is doing that that's where you're really need to invest in your network. And all your friends, all somebody. I'm not just saying your friend, but today we have friends who do that. So I work with GM. This is something in the world of industry. You can call me. Well, the network is full of lies, full of avatars, uh, folks pretending to be something that they're not. Right? Uh, there are there are legitimate and useful uh, job postings and. Uh, Sifting those out really, really does demand you get in touch with a human being and find out if it's real. Take one more question and then we'll release you for lunch. This, well, we'll end with this very important comment, which I'm not sure everyone has had the opportunity to hear. And that is um, the idea of rejecting work. Uh, work has dignity. It's important. And if you reject, as you said, turn up your nose at a job that you might not think is entirely right for you, you are missing some opportunities. And the opportunity you, you indicated was someone who had taken such a job and through, through the kind of service and attitude that he, that he showed, uh, impressed a human resource director who, who was able to help him get a job. So um, uh, on that positive note, uh, we'll, if you have no more questions, we'll go to lunch. We have one question from the internet. The question is, how do you see the impact of the internet on the location of the engineer's business? Will telecommuting and the small office, home office, be a sustainable trend? Telecommuting in a small office is a sustainable trend. Uh, can, you, can you work uh, virtually? I think, and we can, we can maybe have conversations about this at lunch because I know there are people who, who are more into this than I am. Uh, the answer, I think, is yes. Uh, I know some folks who, who have consulting businesses that look like they're big firms, but they're not. And they do, they do important work. Uh, they work by virtue of projects. They hire the people they need for projects. These are virtual organizations. They're like fashion houses. I mean, if you think about, if you think about the trend of how organizations have developed, and you think about a fashion house like Versace, what does Versace own? It owns only the design. Uh, someone I work with uh, has, has uh, plants around the world manufacturing clothing. What is owned is really the design. And the, the organization is virtual. And I think this is a trend that is sustainable, but if it is only sustainable if you have the expertise to do so. So we're going to hear more from Charles Lord this afternoon about maybe those, oppor maybe those opportunities. Um, Is that it? Yes. George. Oh, I'll put up trust here. I'm sorry, I didn't. Hitchhikers may be escaping inmates. 
And if you, I, I love this slide because you see that someone has taken target practice at it. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that happens is, is, is we, begin, we begin to filter the world. If we feel threatened, we begin to filter the world and see it in negative terms. And instead of seeing potential allies and friends, we begin to see enemies. We become defensive and reactive and maybe egotistic. And uh, trust is very important in this. And uh, I, may, I may seem a little, a little soft-sided here, but, but uh, as, we've gone, as we've gone along on this path, uh, I've found more and more that, that's, that, these, that these human qualities are the most important. Any other? I, my answer to that question would be, if you think you've got any chance at all at growth in a company, staying home in pajamas and working on the PC will put you into a dead end. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if, it, if it's your comment is, if you have a chance to work with a real company, and instead you envision, and this is the wishful thinking part of it, you can create a successful virtual company, but in doing, but you better do some business planning around that. Sitting home in your pajamas is not going to is not going to work. And uh, I don't I don't know. Any of you like to sit home and work in your pajamas? And that really that uh, I think what you'd find is that would last for for a very short time. Uh, okay, thank you all very much. It's time for lunch. Exactly noon. And uh, we'll leave this slide up for you to enjoy during lunch.